and welcome to this episode of Sales Secrets from the Top 1%, where the world's best sales experts share their secrets to sales success. And I am thrilled, honored, humbled, and grateful to have with me today, Victor Antonio. Victor is one of the world's best sales speakers, authors, and business consultants. He is a top sales executive, formerly the president of global sales and marketing for a $420 million tech company. Victor has shared the big stage with some of the top business speakers and leaders in the nation. Rudy Giuliani, I butchered that. Yeah. Zig Ziglar, Dr. Robert Schuler, Paul Ertellini, the CEO of Intel, John May, the CEO of FedEx Kinkos, and many other top business speakers. He's the author of 13 books on sales and motivation, recently launched the Sales Velocity Academy learning platform with 300 plus videos. Recently, the publisher of Sales X Machina. Victor, thank you so much for joining us today. Super excited to be here with you, man. Let's do this, man. I'm excited to jump in. Let's talk about sales. Let's talk about how do we make more money. I love it, man. I love it. So the audience, you know, we've been getting a lot of questions as we told the audience we're interviewing you and they're dying to know two things. Number one, what is your top sales secret? If you had to go back to sales, back to selling when you first started, what is that number one top sales secret? How do you execute it? How do you apply it? How can we use it to make more money today? But before we dive into that, the audience is dying to know, who is Victor Antonio, man? where did you come from? What's your background? Where have you worked in sales? And what are those secrets that you've learned throughout every place that you've sold at and worked at and worked for? And uh, let's share that with the audience. So without further ado, man, I'd love to just hear about you, where you came from and, and your background. All right, since I hate talking about myself, we'll try to shoot through this very quickly. So my family's originally from Puerto Rico. So hola to all my bariquas, saludos. Uh, and so, uh, but I was born and raised in Chicago. My family moved in the late 50s. So my mother had a third grade education. My father had a fifth grade education, spoke, didn't speak the language. But my mother was convinced always, you know, learn the language, get the education, get the J-O-B in that order. Learn the language, get the education, get the J-O-B. So uh, my mother was the one that pushed me into getting an engineering degree. And she basically threatened me. She said, if you don't get, uh, go to college, you'll have to go work with your father in the factory. And I'm like, I ain't doing that. Uh, he had what I call a black collar job. And that means it was so dirty. I remember visiting my factory one time. It was so dirty that his collar was black by the time he got home. And I was like, I'm not doing that. And so I remember uh, I needed to find a place to go to college. And I didn't know where to go. And I remember I was in my physics class and I was talking to the teacher. His name is Mr. Hodges. He pointed to the board. You remember the cork boards they used to have back in the day? Yeah. Uh, millennials may not know what I'm talking about, but I figured they could figure, they could imagine what it is. And on there, they had this university called the Illinois Institute of Technology, which is like the MIT of Illinois. Killer. And they had some, they had some courses, right? I go, is that a good school? He says, it's an excellent school if you can get in. And so I looked at the topics, right? The degrees. And it was like civil engineering. I said, uh, no, don't want to do that because I don't want to be nice to people. Two, mechanical engineering. Don't want to do that. I don't want to fix cars. This was my mindset. Yep. Aerospace engineer. I'm like, ah, I don't know about that. Puerto Rican and outer space. That ain't making any sense to me. And then I, I got into it. I saw electrical engineering, like bulb went off. I go, I could do that. And so I go to college, get the degree. Uh, so I graduated with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, got an MBA. Uh, by the way, I'm one of those guys that will tell you, if you get the right degree and the right education, the ROI is fantastic. I love okay? that. There's not a lot of people that say that. I did the yeah. same thing. I got the yeah. undergrad in the MBA and like, I just did it. And like, I never look back with regret. No, I hear some I of these like guys some talking, some of these top speakers talking about a degree is a waste of time. No, the wrong degree is a waste of time. The right degree is a great investment. And so uh, I was in engineering. And so fast forward, I'm working for a company. It's a wireless company. I'm designing wireless systems. To make a long story short, I designed a system that was worth $5 million. We're selling Damn. it to Iowa State Empowering Gas. The sales guy's name was Ken Cook. Ken says, we're going to sell this deal, Victor. We're going to sell your design. Three, four months go by, long sales cycle. We sell the deal. Boom, $5 million, right? Love it. I'm all happy. Ken's all happy. I just sold my first system. 
Ken is happy. He's a sales guy. He celebrates. He says, Victor, I'm going to take you out to lunch. Takes me out. Midday, we get steak and a beer somewhere. I forgot where it was. I'm sure he spent about 50 bucks on me. I was super happy, right? Get back to the office. And I remember walking in the office all happy. And the, uh, the senior application engineer says to me, so Victor, why are you so happy? I said, man, Ken, we just won this big deal. Ken just took me out, spent 50 bucks on me. He said, Victor, let me ask you a question. How big was the deal again? I said, five million. He said, how much do you think Ken's going to make off this deal? And I go, I don't know. He says, well, five million. For sure, he's going to make at least $50,000. I hope you enjoyed your $50 lunch. And he walks away. And at that moment, I'm like, I'm in the wrong business. I need to be in uh. sales. And that was the beginning of me moving into sales. And I joke about that story, but that really was like a paradigm shift. And it was around that time my wife was having our first child, or we just had our first child rather. And I said, you know what? If I need to increase my money, how much I'm making using what I know, maybe sales would be a great place to go. And that's how I got into sales. Wow. So, so you were doing the engineering at Honeywell, built this platform. You guys sold it. This guy rips this $5 million deal, you know, 50,000. Like I'm going to hedge that it was probably even higher potentially it, of a commission than that it for was. sure. Yeah. Uh, and like, were you freaked out at all? Like, no, no, no. Like, I didn't, it, was, it was one of those things you're like, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't think about that. I was so into the design. Like, you know, as an engineer, and the company was called EF Johnson. Honeywell was my first company. The second company was a company called EF Johnson out of Minnesota, and they sold these wireless networks. So, for example, you ever see cops talking on their radios, the push to talk? Yep. Those type of systems, right? Cool. And so, I was so like into the engineering thing that designing a wireless system, I mean, it was 26 sites. I mean, I had to pick the towers, the heights, uh, the antennas, the cabling, the transceivers, everything to serve this area. Wow. And so I was just so proud that my, my system sold. It's like my baby sold. But then that new awareness came in. I said, you know what? You can make some money if you were the salesperson. And that's actually, uh, and by the way, so the way I officially got into sales was, okay, that became, I became aware of making more money. And then there's a position that opened up in Latin America. Okay. And they said, Sweet. we're looking for somebody who has a technical background, understands our product and can speak Spanish. And I'm like, uh, that's me. And like, in Minnesota, yeah, in Minnesota, I was a rare bird. And that's actually how I got into sales. I mean, and I, I haven't looked back since. Wow. And, and when you first got in, like, were you, so you saw the money opportunity. Were you nervous about, okay, I, I don't know anything about sales. Like, right. So when you pitch for that deal, right, to get the mm -hmm. job, you, you know, if you could look back, like, what do you do to get ramped? Like, what did you do to go from engineer to salesperson in that new role? You know, there was, there was a couple of things going on in the background uh, that I don't usually talk about, but I'll share here. And I think it's relevant. And that is, it was, around, it was around 93, and that was around that time frame, where this same company was giving out these tickets to go see these speakers. Peak Performance was an organization in Minnesota. And so, I got some free tickets and go downtown, and that's where I see Zig Ziglar for the first time. Oh, and I'm like, you got to see him in person. Yeah, I'm like, there he is. And I never seen him in person, right? And so all I remember is that that was the moment that marked the day I said, one day I want to be like that guy. One day I want to be that just, guy. Just seeing him, like, what, why do you think you said that? Just like you know, how because motivational he one was? One is that the way he would tell a story, you know, he has that Yazoo, Mississippi way of telling a story. His body language, his way of giving you content, but in, in story version, was just like, it was, it was incredible, as we all know. And it was around that time I said that, I go, I want to become a better speaker. So I then joined, not too long after that, Toastmasters. Nice. And yeah, so a lot of people it, say Toastmasters. And Toastmasters is a speaking organization that's in your area. And they meet once a week. And you start out by, they give you 10 different types of speeches that you have to complete. And wow. it takes you, it takes you from two months to, you know, two years to finish it, depending on your time frame. And it was there that I learned the art of speaking. And second to my engineering degree, that was the greatest investment I've ever made in my sales career. Being wow. able to speak and being able to present. And as you know, if you've done Toastmasters, they give you five to seven minutes. And then after you're done your five to seven minutes on a specific topic, you have three people who give you feedback, which is painful. You know, I still have my first video tape. You want to watch something funny? Wow. If you search online, you type in Victor Antonio first Toastmaster speech, you'll see the actual first speech. I love that you put speech. it online. 
Uh, oh, it is. Man. I love oh, that you put that online. Oh, man. you know what? It's, it's like I'm so bad that people are inspired by it. They go, God, you really sucked. And if you sucked back then, just like I do, maybe I can be as good as you type of thing. So it's pure motivation. And by the way, I have hair and, you know, a couple of pounds lighter. And so it was there that I started competing. And then I realized I was pretty good at speaking. Wow, and so awesome. now, so it, I'm running that in parallel with learning how to sell. And then the second part of that was, is that I had a great mentor for Latin America. This gentleman's name was Jose Santana. He used to talk with this deep voice, big dude, como estas? You know, real deep voice, right? Big dude. And this guy was like smooth, like butter. Do you know what I mean? He would talk yep. and he would never talk fast, never talk slow. He just talked like a gentleman. And I followed him around. So I got to do ride alongs in Latin America, if we can say it that way, where I saw him. I mean, he would walk into offices and people would just want him to be there. And I realized that this guy had this charisma and he technically was pretty good. He knew the products, but it was his charisma, his ability to kind of just like people. I mean, he would bring people coffee. We'd stop at a coffee stand, get a bunch of coffees. And I'm like, what are we doing? He goes, no, no, I know, the, I know what they yeah. like. And we walk in there with a bunch of coffee. He'd bring gifts. He would have bags with him with gifts. And, he would, and this isn't bribery. This is just because he naturally just cared about people yeah. and treat them as friends. And when he walked into the office, it was almost like, you know, like when somebody popular walks in the room, like, hey, he's here. It was that type of greeting. And that became my, I guess, my, my model in my head of who I wanted to be. I want to be that guy that people want to see. When they, you know, when he that shows are excited up, to see sell. that, are, yeah. uh, appreciate and get jacked up about. And, and by the way, did he sell? Of course he did. But he'd go in there, he'd talk, and he had conversations, and then he'd jump into his product pitch. And they would even know. Sometimes they would go, "Okay, Jose, what do you have this month?" Mm -hmm. And he'd be like, "Here's what I got." Wow. And he would just lay it out for them. And they just really, and I, that was the beginning of me learning how to use, I guess, charisma to pull people in close to me, That's and awesome. then realize that. You know, relationships do matter. I always say that. And the market has changed. And we can talk about that. But it was interesting how that's where I learned the art of speaking from Zig Ziglar, but the art of schmoozing from Jose Santana, you know, because wow. we're all an amalgamation of a bunch of different profiles and personalities, if you think about it. Oh, yeah. And so those were two major influences in my ability to speak and sell. Zig Ziglar and Jose Santana out of Latin it. America. Yeah. Wow. Isn't that cool? That's so Dude, awesome. I, I still see the guy in my head. It's so just weird. So when the you, sales secrets, like, uh, you know, check out Toastmasters or just start studying and practicing public speaking. Yeah, everybody. By the way, if you're in sales and you want to become a badass, mm -hmm. join Toastmasters. Do the first 10 speeches and then you can quit. I don't care. Some people just continue on. But do the first 10 speeches from the beginning to the end. When you go through that process, you will be different. You'll be able to present in front of a group, one-on-one -on -one or one-on-one group, in a totally different way. You, there's this awareness they create of what you're doing you know, from the front of the room. Because the majority of speeches I hear from speakers uh, who are sale in, in the business of sales, horrible presenters. The majority of salespeople I hear when they do a pitch are horrible. I'm going with the 80-20 rule and I'm being conservative. 80% are horrible at what they do. Wow. Why, they why, why are they terrible or what's, what are the secrets to being a great speaker in, in your opinion? It, it, it's all about a narrative. When I walk in, it's, uh, you know, I always train on narratives. Why am I walking in to see Brandon? Okay, I'm going to walk in. I'm selling a SaaS product, right? Let's say my own CRM system, right? Yep. I said, now, I'll ask myself three questions. One, does Brandon use one? No, that's one situation. He does use something, but it's like an Excel spreadsheet, but it's not really a CRM. So that's the second scenario. Three, he's using a competitive CRM. Three different possibilities, three different states, three different sales approaches. Yeah, and the first one where he's not first. using anything, in the third party, talking like you're not here, <laughs> where he's not using anything, then I know that I need to create not only awareness, but a need for it, because apparently he doesn't believe that needed. In the situation where they do it themselves, I now know that this customer knows that they need it, but now I have to make them realize that how they're doing it isn't going to get them to where they want to be. Now, scenario number three, they're using a competitor's wise mind different. Three different narratives, three different storylines, depending on the approach, right, or the situation. So, what you learn in Toastmasters and how to speak is, one, let's talk about just personal presence. You ever ask somebody a question and they just hesitate for that little second? They go, yeah. And you hear that? Yeah. And you're like, he doesn't know. He's guessing right now. You ever see somebody just look up to the right with their eyes? 
when you yeah. ask him a question, you go, okay, he's, he's searching for an answer. These are things you learn at Toastmasters not to do, to be aware of. Even body language, how you shift your body, how you square up with people. Uh, you ever square up with somebody and then they turn sideways at a 45 degree angle? Yeah. Their shoulders turn 45, that means what? They're ready to leave that conversation because what you're saying is not interesting. So being able to read body language, being able to be aware of what you say, like the biggest one is obviously people go, um, yeah, so what we're going to do is talk about our product and, um, uh, you know, that whole, and, um, uh, and you hear that and there's no cadence, there's no storytelling. That's another big one. To me, my biggest sales strength is telling great stories and then tying it together how it applies to you. Remember, the, uh, I don't know if you ever hear this version, but when you do a presentation, it's all about story, point, story, point, or point, story, point, story. Make a point, back it up with a story or some facts, or you know, tell a story, then lay down the fact and how it applies to you. Awesome. And if you're sequencing, you're almost like you're shifting when you're doing this, when you're presenting and you're aware of it, you can control an audience. You wow. can move a group. Yeah. So every time I talk one-on-one -on -one or one to a group, I can move them. And one of my biggest secrets, if I can put that in air quotes, is that if, do you play an instrument by any chance? Uh, I, I, I'm a uh, DJ, electronic DJ. dance music. Hey, so is my so, son, by the way. So kind of like uh, yeah. an instrument, but like all yeah. electronic EDM music. Yeah. Yeah. My son uh, also creates EDM music, has his own music. You know, creates, I mean, he just released like two songs. Yeah. In our anyway. office, we literally have a DJ studio here in the office. Oh, there you go. There you go. So if you play like a piano or a guitar and you're listening to this, you know there comes a point where your left hand can do one thing and your right hand can do another. And then you can probably sing at the same time. Three different things are going on. But let's just leave left hand, right hand. What happened to me years ago is that as I'm presenting, I can now, my brain split years ago. By that I mean there is a brain, part of my brain that's talking to you right now, right? And then there's another part of my brain who's in pure surveillance mode. It'll tell me, move Again, to the right, move to the left. Yep. Okay, this person's not keeping up. They're not giving you the right body language. They can just do the most subtle things and my brain will pick it up. They can shift in their seat and I can see, I can ask a question and just how they responded, the little shift, my brain will tell me everything I need to know. That makes and sense. I've learned to pick up those subtleties and I think that's what you gain over time when you become aware of speaking and Again, listening with your eyes, I always say. Listen with your eyes because that's where you'll see the tells yep. of what people are going to do, yay or nay. So those are the things I use a lot. That's incredible. And you, that all started from Toastmasters. Oh, absolutely. It started there. I didn't, you don't realize you have that until you start owning it. And then now I can pick up things. And it's, it's funny when I tell people, I said, look, I just made a statement. I saw you shift. What was that? And they're like, what do you mean? You shifted. I said this, you <laughs> shifted. What was that? You just call them out like confidently. Yeah, I like, call them Hey, out. like I, I know it's like you're looking away now, Johnny. What, why, what, why you what doing that? Or sometimes they'll cock their head. They'll, t they'll do something. And by the way, when I put them on the spot, it's not to put them on the spot. Right. It's to emphasize, did you just shift? What were you just thinking? And they usually go, well, when you said that, here's what I thought. Like, I BS, think that's a I don't secret believe too, by the way. Yeah. I feel like 95% of people, 99, 8% of salespeople are scared to ask that question. Sure. Because yeah. they're worried like, what is the prospect going to think or whatever? But the reality is like, dude, that's a good question. Ask it's a great them. question. Just you ask them, they'll tell you. Well, you'll know what it is. What we used to do back in the day, back in the day, and maybe you can still use the strategy today, today is that when we used to go see a customer, we, we do a four-legged call. It was really okay. two of us, right? Four legs, two, two guys, say, four legs. <laughs> four that's what I mean. Call. Got it's it, a four got it. Two guys. And so in a four-legged call, we would coordinate. Why don't you just call I, it two guys? Two, uh, two, two person call. But why four know. legs? That was just the phrase we used. I'm <laughs> sorry, brother. I'm sorry, man. So, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. So, I never heard that before. A, a four, you never heard of a four-legged call? No. That was a four-legged call. Awesome. And so our boss would always say, is it a two-legger or a four-legger? I go, dude, it's a two-legger. It's a two-legged call. And so a four-legged call, two guys would walk in, right? And what would happen is that we would agree somebody would ask the questions and run the meeting and the other person would just sit and observe. This was very useful if we're talking to five or 10 people. And so the other person's job was to monitor what was going on. Because you're too busy talking, you're into your presentation, you're trying to do something. The other person's job was to monitor. And it was interesting because sometimes we'd have like a 10 minute break before we started again. And then we do a quick debrief. What did you, you know, when you ask that question, everybody pulled back. There's something there. You need to ask more questions there. 
By the way, did you see how the CTO nodded in affirmative when you said we have that? So dig into that one because that right there, you know, generated a positive response. That's why a four-legged call is sometimes interesting to have yeah, people tell get that real-time feedback. Right. That thought but process. even if you're only doing yourself and another person, how many times, if you're listening to this, has this happened? You're talking, you're talking, and all of a sudden you, you, you detected something. Something subtle. It's in the tone, the voice, the shift of the body, a micro gesture on their face. And your brain says, what was that? But then you keep going. And then later on, you wonder, what was that? And then now you leave the meeting and you're still guessing, what was that? Yeah. Maybe if you had stopped right there, and this is where I think the best salespeople kick in, a good salesperson would say, what was that? I just said that and you kind of did this. That tells me either this or that, which one is it? Notice how I funnel them into an option real quick. Right. That means that's not of interest to you or it's interesting, but you're just not sure if it'll work for you. Which one is it? And he goes, no, no, Victor, when you said that, I was just thinking, we're not going to use that. Well, great. Let's not talk about that anymore. What do you use? You see how that creates a whole different dialogue. Yeah. And so changes I love the convo, that. changes the oh, narrative. Absolutely. And then you can focus yeah. on what they give a damn about. By the way, one of the most most powerful books I've read in a long time, and I, this is like, you know, I, I call my bookshelf the golden bookshelf mm -hmm. because uh, I throw away books twice a year. Like literally, by throw away, I mean I give them to the goodwill. And that okay. is I purge my library. I'm not that guy who's going to have like a million books behind me. No, mm -hmm. that's not me. Only books who deserve to stay on my shelf stay on my shelf. Okay. You know, and I know that when I have a book on my shelf, it's because there's something specific in there that they've solved. So it's almost like I don't want every tool. I want the tools I need. And so I read a book uh, a few years ago, and I think I've read it now three times. That's how good it is. It's called The Challenger Sale. Yeah. 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 Matt and, Dixon, right? Yeah. Matt Dixon and something Tolman, a couple others. But if you've not read that book, you got to read the book. You got to read the book. I mean, that yeah, right it's there. It's like Enterprise Selling 101, you know? Yeah. And so, it's you know, so in there, remember, the challenger was a person who would teach for differentiation, right? Teach for differentiation, tailor for resonance, tailor to what they wanted, but also take control of the conversation and not be afraid to ask those tough questions. That's why I bring that up now. I love that. Yeah, great book, guys. Challenger Sale, Matt Dixon. You can pick it up on Amazon. Great yeah, that book. was a big one. I, I remember reading it. It reminded me of uh, I, one of the first sales books I read was by Jill Conrad, Selling to Big Companies when I started yep. at IBM great book. Interactive. And, great um, book. And then like that was like, okay, you're dealing with Fortune 500, Fortune 250. Right. And then the Challenger sale came out a few years later. And uh, yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. You know one. what's interesting is that most people don't really think about this. The Challenger sale came out in de December 2011. Previous to that, the only book I truly respected was Spin Selling by Neil Rackham that came out in 1986-87. And the reason I say respected was because in 1987, when Spin Selling came out, that was the first book to basically do an empirical study funded by Xerox on salespeople. Right. It was a study. You know what I mean? It was hardcore data. Fast forward 2011, now we have the Challenger Sale, another study. Those to me are the two bookends so far of two of the best sales books I've ever read. Yeah, a lot of people that we interview always talk about Neil's spin selling. I, oh, I read that like in college. I remember it was like a required he's, reading. He's the gold standard. Yeah. By the way, what's interesting about it, uh, to me, Neil Rackham, people always talk about the other people like, you know, I love Zig Ziglar, uh, Brian Tracy. You'll throw in any name yeah. you want to give me on sales. I always go back to Neil Rackham as the gold standard. What's even fascinating, if you can just tie this into a full circle, is Neil Rackham wrote that book, Spin Selling, which is about find out what the situation is, what is the problem, what are the implications, and what's the need payoff, right? And then fast forward, 1987, fast forward to 2011, the challenger comes out. Who writes the forward? Neil Rackham. Yep. Yeah. Beautiful. Poetry, man. Poetry is it's beautiful. Like, uh, I think he's like almost 80 now. Uh, Dude, he's, he's, did, you he's ever awesome. get, did you ever get to meet Neil? No, but I met Zig Ziglar and spoke on the stage, same stage with Zig Ziglar. That was like that's, my highlight. That's baller. <laughs> I, that was monster, man. That was, uh, he was, man, you know how they say you shouldn't meet your idols? Yeah. Uh, this is one where you wanted to meet your idol and it confirmed everything I thought about the guy. The man was awesome, man. The man that, was that's awesome. why I love this show because like, you know, I consider you one of my idols. Like I, I get to meet all of our, the, the, the sales idols and then just depict like, what are all your secrets with, everyone listening to the show. And I, I think it's awesome. We, we appreciate you guys doing this. Um, so, 
Okay, you learn how to present. And by the way, I just dove into, uh, I, I was speaking to, to uh, like uh, 300 people. It was like the first time I was speaking to like hundreds of people. Uh, look, I know you do this every day of the week. Mm-hmm. And I was reading uh, Talk Talk Like Ted right. by the, the author that Carmine. wrote. Yeah, Carmine. And then he wrote, um, he also wrote Presentation Secrets of Steve Jobs. Great, great book as well. Read them both. Yeah. Have you ever had a speaking? Everyone tells me, like, if you want a keynote all the time, like Victor, like Grant, yeah. like uh, Anthony and Arena, like Jill, you should get a speaking coach. Did you ever get no. like a speaking coach or a keynote coach no. or anything? No, I didn't. Just the Toastmasters. I, I, think the, uh, I think for me is that, well, here I had a moment. So I did a documentary film. Uh, you can search for it online. It's called The Motivator, The Business of Selling Hope. Uh, wow. It was filmed uh, 10 or 11 years ago. It actually won, nominated for several film festivals and won one international film festival award. And so it's online, YouTube for free. And it's called what The Motivator. What is it called? It calls, the Motivator. The Motivator. And just type business in Victor Antonio. Selling Hope. Yeah, the business selling hope. And in there, I tell the story about how I, you know, the Zig Ziglar story is in there. And, but in there, I talk about how when I left corporate America, I used to do the standard speeches, you know, which is tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you just told them, right? Your basic speeches. And I remember that uh, I was speaking in the college market at the time. That's where I started my speaking career. And again, the, the, the documentary tells the whole story in full detail. Wow. But what happened was I'm doing these presentations and I'm just not feeling it, right? I'm just not feeling it. And so I remember I was in, uh, it was Orlando, Valencia College. And I remember I had a moment. I had a moment as I'm driving from Miami where we lived at the time up to Orlando. I'm driving. I'm like, you know, I'm not making as much money as I'd like to right? Mm -hmm. And this is something I like to tell people when you go into the speaking business, you know, don't believe all the stories about you can be a millionaire from one day to another. No, it takes work, hustle, and you got to be damn good at it. And so initially I was like struggling. I think my first year I only made like $17,000. So I fought my way through to the top as they say. But anyway, so I'm driving, right? And it was around that time I was making that $17,000. I said, look, I'm not making any money. Mm -hmm. I'm not having any fun. And then I asked myself that key question. Remember the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? Yep. The circle of influence. There's yep. things you can't control and then there's things you can control. And I asked myself, what can I control? Well, I can't control, you know, the market and all these other things, but I can't control how much fun I have with this. And that was the day I made the fateful decision to now implement my style of speaking. So if you've seen me speak, there's a lot, there's humor and content with some motivation. That's kind of the, the three overlaying, you know, that's the Venn diagram. And I was so scared because I was about to go do it my way. Oh. Right, like I do it my way. And I just like, I just let her rip. After the first two minutes, I was into it. And man, at the end, it was like, it felt so different. And that's when I knew I had found my style, my voice, how I speak. The next day, I had to fly out and do a Bell South, which is a tech company. Now I'm talking to leaders, not college people. And I said, do I go back to the corporate style? Uh-oh. Or do I just unleash the beast on this thing? Yeah. Dude, I unleashed the beast. All I remember is I finished it with, uh, it was in a room, and I, I finished on the table with one of my shoes in my hand. I don't remember why I did that. But it was like off the Shoe chain, in man. your head? Dude, dude, it was off the chain, man. At that point, I'm like, I found my style. And then, so my style is very different. And so if you've seen me speak live, you know what I'm talking about. And it's an experience, man. And so that's where I learned how to really come up with my style. So did I get a speech coach? No. But remember, Toastmasters was my speech coach. Yeah, that, that was like an ex- that was like a master class, speaking well, master. We had a guy in there. I tell the story in the documentary. His name was Hale. Hale was like, man, he was good. I mean, he was so good that I just wanted to beat him so bad. You ever get that one person you just got to beat? Yeah. And I remember I went up against him the first time. Slaughter didn't make the, last, the, 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 the final round. I think the second or third year, I finally beat him. And I go, okay, I'm getting there, man. I think I'm good. Uh, so they, they scored you basically. Yeah, they, they, they like gave us. you grades, scored you, and whatnot. You got wow. it, man. One of the one of the uh, one of my secrets, truly a secret, truly a secret. Nice. That's never been documented. I think anywhere yes. is that people ask me, said Victor, you know, your style, your delivery, your stories. You know, where do they come from? You know, how do you come up with them? And obviously, they're personal stories. And so my style started out with it was very Ziggler esque right? Okay. Motivation, tell the story, you know, man's walking down the street, comes across the big farm, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Right. And then I started watching comedians mm. and how they set up a story. And there's two guys, uh, that I follow religiously. 
And uh, Bill Burr, you know who Bill Burr is? B U R R. Bill Burr. When you watch Bill Burr, he's funny. But more than just funny, the way he sets up a story, the way he sets it up and then knocks it down, then does a callback 20 minutes later, is genius. Like and so, loop, he does like a loop. A loop you know back. how you, you, you mentioned something now, then 20 minutes later, you tie it back to what you said 20 minutes ago, and you go, oh, yeah. And it's like, wow. so he does these, these callbacks, they call them. But his ability is to tell a story. George Carlin was another one. If you listen to George, that's, that's really old school. Uh, and there's Sebastian Maniscalco who also has a way of telling stories. So I watch some of these comedians because I love the way they tell a story. The setup is great. And you're like, where is he going with the story? And then when they get there, you're like, oh, that's the payoff. Because we know in speaking, the longer the story, the bigger the payoff has to be. Uh, that's what a lot of speakers don't know. That if you tell a short story, you can get away with some cheesy stuff. But if you're going to get a five or 10 story, 10 minute story going, it better have a big payoff. So that's usually the rule. The longer the story, the bigger the payoff. And so how you set up a story and then how you knock it down, how does this apply to selling? Sometimes if you begin with a story, it frames the conversation. Mm. See, that's the key. If you can find the right story to frame a conversation, then you go, ah, oh, I get it. You know, for example, I always tell a story about I was looking for a drone. Right? Wanted to buy a drone? Yeah, a drone. I just wanted to buy a drone. You just wanted to play? Yeah, I wanted to buy a drone. I wanted to film stuff. And I wanted one that followed me because I had this whole idea of me speaking to a drone, right? (laughs) And so I'm doing research for the- For for live TV or like LinkedIn Live or YouTube? No, 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 no. no. I was going to use it for like regular film and then chop it up. Okay. So like instead of having to like set up your camera, you're just like, oh, I'll just turn on the drone. Yeah. And the problem is that it makes too much- That sounds like so much work. Yeah, it does. But, I, you know, your brain goes there sometimes, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so I want to buy this. So I, you know, I tell the story. I want to get this drone. I tell people what I, I want to I thought of the it. same idea, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> like, so, I totally thought of <laughs> the same that. idea. Great minds. Great minds think alike. And so I do this research and I'm ready to buy my drone. And so I go to the store and sure enough, I see the drones at Best Buy. And they're like six or seven drones. Big dude comes over. I'm 6'2". He's about 6'7". Big dude. Comes over and says, can I help you? I said, well, you know, I'm looking at these drones here. I've narrowed it down to these three. Let me look at this and let me just think about it. He goes, well, if you have any questions, come back to me. Right? Fast forward the story. I said, all right, I'm ready. I got some questions. He comes over and I said, all right, it's down to these three, but I think it's between these two right here. Can you tell me the difference? Why was one better than the other? And then he starts reading the little placards. And I'm like, dude, I can read that. Yeah. But besides that, I can what, do the what are the differences? And he said, well, you know, uh, that's as much as I can tell you. And I'm like, I remember sitting there going, you know, okay, thank you. And then I walked out of the store, right? Now, when I tell this story, people go, where's he going with the story? He says, how many times, because remember, I was ready to spend $1,200. Right. $1,200. Those just are not out. cheap. And those Best right. Buy guys, they get commission on those deals too. Right. So when I tell the story, I go, how many times are people walking out with $1,200 every day in your business? Because your folks are not trained. And if they're trained, they're only trained on things that are obvious to the new buyers today. And today's buyer is more informed than ever, so they have to know more than the buyer. So I would set up a story like that. What I'm going to show you today is how do you sell to an informed buyer so that doesn't happen to you, so money just simply doesn't walk out the door. Does that make sense? And they're like, yeah. All right. Let's talk about yeah. this, Victor. You know, yeah. so that's a story. It's a simple story, but it's, it frames the conversation and makes the person go, okay, I see where this guy's going. Now I can tell whatever story I want or do the training and they go, I know what he's trying to accomplish. So that's when storytelling can really help you, like even frame a full conversation. I love that. Yeah. yeah. When, when I was going to speak in, uh, I was speaking in Alaska and then and speaking in Miami, like I was reading that Ted talk with Ted book and they're like, they, they say that, uh, stories are remembered 60 to 70% more than just words or yep. whatever oh, you're trying to say. It's a big number, whatever it is. Yeah, it's a big difference. We're very Massive. visual creatures. Kind of like pictures versus text on a PowerPoint slide. They say pictures are remembered 64% more than text. Yeah. And the more, the more, there's several components within that. That is, if I can make the story relatable to you, you go, yeah, I feel that. I get that because I've been in that situation. That even ties it down more. If you can add texture to the story, like this, for example, there I am sitting, nobody's around. Guy walks up to me. He's dirty. He's poor. 
no teeth. You know, when you start doing that, people are like, where's he going with this story? Stuff like that is texture to a story. Yep. And if you know how to use texture within storytelling, it even makes it that much more memorable. So if you can add texture and then you can tie it to some emotional pain point that we've all been through, some common experience, that really hooks them in. Wow. So don't just tell a story to tell it because it's more memorable. Tell a story that's relatable and has context in it that people go, oh, yeah, yeah, I see where he's going with this. And when you're thinking about emotional context, you yep. know, you mean like going from like poor to rich or like, like what are some examples of, you know, the emotional context? Here, you're, a, you're a CEO of a company. Mm -hmm. And I said, look, I said, one of the things we all hate is having to go in front of our board to explain why we didn't hit the number. They've given us the money. They've given us the resources. We have the marketing in place. We've done all these things. And yet, we now have to go in there and explain. And in that room, we're going to have the CEO of X company who doesn't like this, the CTO of DA who doesn't like this. He says, is that your situation? And if you do that to the right CEO, they're going to go, yeah, that's exactly my situation. Yeah. So how do you deliver the bad news? What if I can walk? You see what I mean? Just stuff like that I do to people. Yep. And yeah, they go, like yeah. You see how I put, him, that they I put him in his environment, in that space. That's what I mean by an emotional connection. That, dude, I get you. I Here's that. what I know you're dealing with. And when you're talking like that, that's a different conversation. Because the CEO or the CXO in front of you goes, he gets me. Mm -hmm. you no, know, I always joke that there's a difference between sympathy and empathy. This is the difference between the greatest salespeople and those who are not. Most salespeople, again, let's do the 80-20, are sympathizers, not empathizers. Here's the difference. Here's a visual so you'll never forget. It. By the way, I'm about to tell you a story. Watch how I lay the visual out so you'll never forget it. Okay, so I'm about to tell you what I'm about to do to you. Okay, are you with me? Yeah, I okay, love so it. Audience is with us. Let's do so it. Now I, now I set this up. I said, look, 80-20 rule, Pareto principle. I already set it up like that, right? 80% are sympathizers, and then 20% are empathizers. At this very moment, you're going, what's the difference? Right. Second, you're thinking, who am I? Am I a sympathizer or empathizer? I wonder what he's going to say. Here's what I'm going to say. So the difference between sympathy and empathy is the following. Let me tell you a story. Imagine you're on the deck of a boat. You're on a cruise ship, deck of a boat, sipping your little martini, whatever drink you have. You're watching the sunset in all its glory, right? All of a sudden, this guy just comes right by you bumps you a little bit and keeps walking. And you're watching this guy as he wobbles all the way to the edge of the boat. He gets to the edge of the boat. He grabs the banister. He bends over the banister and he starts puking his guts out. Everything from yesterday is coming out, right? And at that moment, you go, dang, that must hurt. That's sympathy. Now, if you went over there right next to him, held onto the banner, stuck your finger in your mouth and puked with him, that's empathy. That's the difference. So if you can puke with your customers, see a lot of you don't know how to puke with your customers and you do that visual to people. They're like, what the hell? They'll never forget that visual because sympathizers go, wow, that must be really hard. Pukers go, dude, I feel your pain. I am in there with you. I am puking with you. So I am telling you now that if you want to be a great salesperson, learn to puke with your customers. How's that for a visual you'll never forget? You know, something like puke that. Your <laughs> you'll never forget that. <laughs> wow. Puke with your customers, man. Puke there, with them. There we go. I, but I that's love what that. I, when I was telling the CEO story, they had to go in front of his board. I'm puking with them. I says, dude, I've been there. I know yep. what you go through. Here's what you're worried about. And he goes, Like yeah. a day in the life, day in their shoes type of thing. You got you, it. You a point relate. of view, POV. Yeah. 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 That was, that was one of the interesting things. Like, uh, you know, w when I used to sell for Google, yeah, I pitched these CMOs that are spending almost 500 million, 250 million on paid ads. <laughs> and I'm selling them as a guy that never ran paid ads before, you know? Right. And it's like, I would try to create the stories of the, the, the puke in your shoes or puke with you, the empathy, but it was a lot of sympathy. Like, Hey, you want to do better. You want to go from point A to point B. You right. want to make more money. I, I could totally relate to that. that. That makes a lot of sense. I think, and, I think if salespeople just took the time to really puke, like really just put yourself visually, even if you've never experienced it. Like for example, ads, you know what the deal is. Mm -hmm. Even if we've never run ads, here's what we know. 50%, what was that guy, John Wanamaker's rule? 50% of my marketing doesn't work. I just don't know which 50%, that yeah. type of thing, right? And so we know that one of the biggest concerns is you don't even know if it's working. Well, how are you testing it? Are you doing split testing? Does split testing really work? I said, how are you measuring this? How do you get the ROI? What's tangible? What's not tangible? These are all the questions you have. Here's why I'm here to present to you. 
because I'm going to show you how we'll make that tangible. And you're like, that. okay, go ahead. But, That's but it. You, so you've been on like some of the largest stages in the world. When when you get hired to do a keynote or get hired to speak at a massive event with Zig Ziglar, what's like your prep strategy? I'm just curious. Like, okay, so I, I write you a check to speak at our next big President's Club sure. event. I'm right. going to have you speak in front of 1,000 people, 5,000 people, 10,000 people, or 100 people, whatever it may be. Like what what is now your prep or like, like, okay, from giving you the check to when you're on stage, what do you do from now till then um, to, to give a great presentation, performance, whatever you call it? Sure. So you say from the checkpoint to the event. To me, it, it started way back when, if you know what I mean. And I back that up because mm. what, what happened before I got that check was I do a lot of, uh, you see this, like, like, literally, I just had this on my desk. I got a lot of index cards, right, like this. And so, if I take it downstairs to my other office, uh, I have a lot of index cards. On these index cards, I write what I call five to seven minute modules. Five to seven minute modules. And in this five to seven minute module, there's typically a story and a point I'm trying to make. And it could be, like for example, the puking story could be what I'll call the point of view story. Right, I'll call that the point of view story. What's your point of view story? And I'll do that sympathy, empathy, whole bit. And then my point will be, remember, story, point, story, point, point, story. My story was that. My point is that if you really want to connect with your buyers, you got to puke with them. That would be one of my statements and people would have fun with that. But they would walk away going, yeah, I really need to get in. I need to marinate with my customers more. That could be one of the takeaways, right? And so that would be a five to seven minute module on the stage. So I got like literally hundreds of these, hundreds. If I were to calculate, I'll say about two, 225 of these modules in my head. Just different stories that you may tell yes. to so convey what, a story yeah. and a point with the audience. Right, so now you hired me, right? And now I'm gonna ask you, tell me who's in your audience. You say, Victor, they're mostly entrepreneurs. Tell me what you're selling, Ra -da -da. this is what they sell. I'll say, what are some of the obstacles they're facing? You know, they need to be better at prospecting, right? They don't know how to close. They need to increase the average order size. They need to reduce their sales cycle, whatever it may be. So you give me four or five of these. That's all I need. Typically, people give me five things. I say, give me five things. And then what I do is I literally go back to my database of cards, right? Wow. And just scan what I need. I go, okay, that story would be good. And then what I'll do is I'll lay, if you guys can visualize this, I'll lay the index cards, the one that I'm going to use, on my desk, by the way, you'll see this in The Motivator. If you watch the movie, The Motivator. I can't wait to watch this thing. Yeah, you said it's I, free I, on uh, YouTube? Yep, I've been doing this. And so in there, you'll see me do the cards. Mm -hmm. You'll see me do the cards. That's how long I've been doing it. Wow. And so what I do, I go, oh yeah, let me, let me do the, uh, and then I give them names. So right? like is the best buy story on a card with the drone? Yes, it is. There you go. That's there one of the 225. That, that is the, that one falls under uh, not educating your people. Yep. And money walking out the door. That one could be on, I'll, I'll put that one probably so on the like product IQ. like themes for the yes. index cards. That would be product IQ. Like not knowing your product can cost you money. Damn. You know, and so then I have all these cards. So now when people ask me, what do you want to speak on? I just had a conference call before we got on this one. Same thing. Give me three to five things I always ask them. And again, five is usually the best. Three is, you know, the minimum. And the guy said, look, Victor, right now prospecting is a big one. He said, they're so used to sitting and serving that they forgot to get up and get somewhere and go do some prospecting. I was like, ah, that's one. The other one was, you know, they need to get better at storytelling. Well, I got a bunch of those, right? Because I tell people how I do stories the whole bit. And then I forgot what the third one was. Um, I can't remember right now, but it was something else. I go, yeah. And then my, my brain says, yeah, do that one. Oh, uh, one was about creating good habits. Got a totally separate story on that. And so then I just assemble my cards. Now, a lot of these are in my head already, but I just go through the cards once in a while just to remind myself of what I have in there because yeah. sometimes I forget my own what's stories. What's in the library? What, what's available? Yeah, I mean, when you're, on, when you're over 200, that's a lot, you know, to remember. And sometimes yeah. I go, oh, I totally forgot about that story. And so, I mean, I've gotten to the point where I do a full-day workshop called the Sales Mastery Intensive, which is 12 modules, 12 hours with 12 people. Let me say that again, 12 hours, 12 modules with 12 people, and I don't use PowerPoint. Flip chart all day. The longest we've gone is 14 hours. When you say flip chart, what, what do you mean? What was a flip chart? Like, what do you mean by that? Like flip chart, like a piece of, I don't use a PowerPoint. Yeah, I got so PowerPoint, talking. but it's talking, drawing, you and I going back and forth, 
You disagree? Well, here, let's try this. Let's try this. Mm-hmm. So when people walk out of my workshops, it's not up here in their head. Do you know what I mean? We've worked yeah. it out. Yeah, so people walk out like with a play interactive. Playbook. Yeah. Oh, it's totally interactive. And so I don't, uh, too many, you can tell a good sales trainer from a not good sales trainer. Great sales trainers don't need to hide behind a PowerPoint, you know? And so people say, you do 12 hours with no slides. I go, yes. Okay. And at the end of, and by the way, we've gone 14 because they wanted to keep going. That's how good they are. Wow. And, and that's and- content. So like when when you create these index cards, just any time that you have an experience where like, oh my gosh, that's a good story that that could drive home this point, like. Correct. That's one way of doing it. So one way of doing it is that, you know, you have an incident, right? Uh, Something just happened. Oh yeah. Like for example, this one I just got. Give me the good, what about the good habits one? That's a good one. The good habits one. So the good habit, that's a visual that I have to draw out when I use the flip charts. And that is, uh, let me see if I can do this mentally with you. If you want that one. Okay. Yeah. But before I forget, so I just got back from Virginia two days ago, right? Okay. So we're in Virginia. I walk into a restaurant. It's a beautiful, perfect day. I'm with my wife, right? Awesome. And they got tables outside the whole bit. And I'm like, yeah, we love here. We just got here. Want to eat here. Breakfast. It's like 10 o'clock. And I said, but we'd like to eat outside. She says, well, we're not serving outside. Mm. I said, but it's such a beautiful day. But you got tables out there. Yeah, but right now we're not serving. And I remember I said, okay, well, no, thank you, because we want to be outside. So we went right across the street where you can actually sit outside and eat, right? And I'm like, I told my wife, I said, see, that's a story. I don't know what I'm going to do with that story, but here's a woman who I know isn't the owner of the business. Because mm-hmm. for another 10 to 15 feet that they had to walk, by the way, our Dude. bill was about $50 by the time we do, could done with breakfast. That could have been their $50. Mm-hmm. And because they didn't want to walk an extra 15 feet past the door outside to the table, they just lost that. Mm-hmm. And I said, this is a perfect example of when you don't take ownership of the business. So that's a story. Now, this is two days ago. That will become a module. Mo- you know what I mean? Module and a note card. That's what I do. And yeah. so the so you want the habit one. You really you, want. And then do you put that into the like your training courses? Then is that like how you create your content for training? No, uh, no, not for that one. That wouldn't make it. I don't know if that one would make it. That would be more of a keynote. That's keynote fodder. Okay. That's how I would use that. That's keynote fodder. I mean, could I use it if if it, the point came up? Yeah. What's cool is that my brain can recall some of this stuff. When somebody asks me a question, I go, oh, yeah, let me tell you a story, right? And I could tell that story. But that would be keynote fodder. Okay. I, I can't see how I would extend that. Now, by the way, let me back up. If I was doing a presentation, which I don't, on customer service, that would probably be a great story to put as part of a module within the training. You know what? How to be aware of when you're losing money or something like that. Yeah. But I'm all that's about awesome. sales. So that's just going to be a great story from the front of the room that says, you know, when you don't take ownership, and that would be, for example, if I did a leadership conference, a sales leadership, yep. and I said, listen, managers, it is, and I tell them this story, I said, here's the problem. Your salespeople are just like that lady. They haven't taken personal ownership of the business, which means they're losing business every day. You see how I tie that in? Yeah, every day. I mean, and that could so, definitely be sales leadership, right? Empowering, yeah. empowering your salespeople to become owners in the business. And, and yeah, I, I like that, that would be the angle. So that would be, that would be leadership uh, ownership, taking ownership of what you're selling, mm-hmm. seeing the business as yours, not somebody else's. And I'm just an employee because that's yep. how she saw herself. Wow. And so that just happened again, two days ago. And so I would use that and that becomes a module. Got it. That's incredible, yeah. man. So then yeah. you get hired and you just figure out the different stories that you're going to tell. I move my index card. Well, like I said, if you watch the movie, you'll see me moving around index cards on the table. And then I grab those index cards. Then I summarize everything on one index card because I know, already know the stories. Yep. And so when I, before, and I'm showing this, for those of you who just listen to audio, I'm showing an a index card. It'll have five or six stories. And I know how to weave between, or I guess weave together those five or six stories. Wow. And that's the theme. So when somebody says, give me something different, all right, what do you want? And then I can do that. Do you still get nervous when you speak? I, no, I get anxious is what it is. I think that's my, I'm like, come on, hurry up. Like the previous, the speaker before me is like, all right, just finish up. I need to get up there. Because once I get up there, it's over, you know? And so once I, the, I used to get nervous, I guess years ago, but now it's almost second nature. I know my delivery so well. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was doing the, uh, if you want to watch a really interesting one, if you want yeah. to learn, uh, search online for Victor Antonio Grant Cardone, okay. 10X. Love it. And so what happened was, uh, this is the first 10X conference they did. Grant asked me to be on the platform, right? Yep. And so you'll see that my slides tank. 
Uh. They tank, but they had a flip chart up there. And this guy, they had a whiteboard up there. Mm-hmm. And dude, I just said, screw the slides. I'll just do it off the whiteboard. And I just went for it because I know my content. And I got more respect for that because it's like people go, okay, you know your business because you didn't even care about the slides. You're like, ah, screw the slides. That's and amazing. so that's when you know you know your content. But here's a shocker. I had never given that presentation. Really? That was the first time I gave that presentation. All the key components of the presentation. I mean, there was a couple of stories that I've used always. But the content, 80% of the content was the first time I was presenting it. But I knew it. Wow. Because one, a lot of it was my personal story and I mm-hmm. rehearsed it. And so one of the things I do is I run things through my head. Mm-hmm. Like well, I walk around the house. It's kind of weird to see sometimes. Yep. I walk around the house and I'm just doing these gestures because one of the things I pride myself on, I think I'm one of the best to do it. And that when you see me speak live, my words match my gestures and vice versa. The ability to like draw a story with my hands and tell a story and lean into a presentation is very different. That's and it's awesome. a complete presentation. So now when you watch the presentation, you're going to say, okay, I see what he means. And yeah. so I walk around the house gesturing trying to find different things, you know, like how do you gesture for lightning? You know, I, I'll make stuff up like that. I go like that or something, you know, yeah. you do something, you go like yeah, that, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, when somebody's confused, what's your facial on that one? Like, you know, or that, what's your hand gesture? And so I walk around as I'm telling a story, think of any story you have and gesture your way through it. Wow. And what happens over time is that this becomes very natural. So when you're doing a presentation in front of like five people or 10 people, you can actually, it'll come across. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like Even you're though, like building it uh, yeah. like with your gestures. That's it. People go, man, he's just, he's just drawing this thing that's for me. That's another secret, like, like yeah. using gestures to right. tell stories that sell. I break planes. And one of the ways to break a plane is like, for example, most speakers don't like putting their arms above like their midst, right below your chest, right below your chest, above your stomach, below your chest. Most speakers don't raise their arms beyond that. It's a really weird thing to watch. So what I do is I always say, break the plane. You know, put your hands above your head type of thing. Or if you're going to tell a story, it's okay to crouch and lean into something. Don't just pace back and forth. You know, and I see that a lot. And I think people miss out that when they don't use their body in a certain way, they just can't communicate as effectively. I love that. I love that. And how many people were at the, that 10X conference that you spoke at? I think it was like 3,000. That was the first one. They killed yeah. it, man. They did a yeah, great job, a man. It was, it was amazing. Yeah, uh, Grant was awesome. a great host. I mean, the whole event was great. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that. It was it was a big success. I remember watching it virtually. Uh, it was it was awesome. And I guess you know we we've gone over a lot of different secrets that you've had. And uh, now now we're at the point where the audience is dying to know. Out of everything that you've learned, everything mm. that you've accomplished, sales secrets from the top one percent, where the world's best sales experts share their secrets to sales success. Victor Antonio, if you had to go back in time to when you first started in selling after everything that you've learned, what is your number one top sales secret? All right, I got two. They're, they're tied for first, if I can Perfect. cheat that way. Yeah, let's the, cheat. So, you know, I have a, a podcast called Sales Influence, which is subtitled Finding the Why and How People Buy. Because I believe if you understand how people buy or why they don't buy, you can sell to them more effectively. It's almost that point of view thing. If I understand resistance, why you won't buy, then I can sell you more effectively. So that's the, I'll call that 1A. Here's the one. Here is the one. And I'm going to give you a book that you can actually forward, an ebook that you can forward to others. And if you learn this one strategy, here's my claim. If you learn this one strategy, 10% close rate, easy, minimum, minimum. Okay. That's what I'm saying. 10%. 10% 10% increase minimum. minimum. Okay. Love it. So let me tell you the story. So a few years ago, a company calls me up and I'll give you the short version, but again, the payoff will be there. So, right. See, that's a callback to our original conversation about payback. See, that's a callback. So anyway, so the company calls me up and says, Hey, Victor, uh, we're looking, we, we sell this product. Uh, it's a software product. Um, we sell it. It's a $3,000 product, $6,000 product. We got six trainers. We're looking for a seventh trainer right? We're looking for a seventh trainer to which I said, okay, cool. And so I said, well, how much do your trainers make? And the guy tells me the number and I couldn't believe it. It was that high. 
And I said, uh, let me think about it. You know how when you're not sure or something, you go, let me think about it. And he said, I'll call, I told him, I'll call you back. I never called him back. A week later, he calls back, says, Victor, you never called me back. What's up? I said, man, are you telling me your trainers make that much money? Are you kidding me? He said, I'll tell you what, Victor, why don't we fly you down to Orlando? We got an event. We'll sit in the back. We'll watch it. We'll pay your flight, take you out to dinner the night before. You can watch the events, a full day event. At the end of the day, you can say yay or nay. If you say nay, hey, we still shake hands. You go back to Atlanta, Georgia. I said, fine. Flew down to Orlando, sat in the back. To make numbers easy, let's say they had about 200 people in the audience, right? 200 people in the audience. Yep. In those 200 people, this guy, the trainer gets up there and it's a full day event and he's up there describing, demoing the product. It's a software product. Here's what it does. Point, click, drag, drop. Here's how you create these files, whatever it may be. So midday, he had closed some deals. By the end of the day, make a long story short, he closed half the room. Half the mm. room. And the majority of people bought the $6,000 product. He sold about half a million dollars that day. What? Right? And I leaned over to, I remember I leaned, his name was Jason. I leaned over to Jason. I said, dude, how much money did he just make? And he told me. And I go, gee, okay, I'm in. Right? He says, great. Loved it. <laughs> you know, like, okay, validated. So they gave me a, a think of a booklet that was a script and the, and the slides, the PowerPoint slides. And then you had to learn the software. I never used a script. Uh, but they said, you can play with it. Just certain things you got to hit, Victor, in your script. I said, great. That's a full day. So you can imagine, it's a full day script. It's a lot of content. So after about a month of, of rehearsing, practicing the stuff. It's down to Jackson, Mississippi. Why Jackson, Mississippi? They figured I couldn't do a lot of damage down there, if you know what I mean. So they put me in a small room with about 50, 60 plus people. At the end of the day, we closed about 17% of the room. I, I remember that number. And I remember I walked out of there with, it was like $5,000. I was like, yeah, not bad for a good first day, right? They were like, no, Victor, that is bad. We closed only 17% of the room and our minimum is 33% of the room. Mm. And I was like, oh, crap. Okay, let's get on our horse now. So for the next, this part I'm making up because I don't remember how long it was. For the next month or two, I'm just struggling. I'm going into these markets. I'm just not, I mean, I get to 17, 18, 19, 20, 24, back down to 20, back down to 17. Not kidding it, not hitting it. And so finally, we're doing an event in California that had three, 400 people. And they said, you know, we're going to send out the big gun. His name is Clint. Clint's going to come out. He's the guy that knows how to do this. He's going to stand in the back of the room. He's going to watch what you do and then provide the necessary feedback. Kind of like sure Toastmasters. Huh? Was that? A la Toastmasters. Kind of like the four leg. Right. So he's, so he's back there. He's watching. I said, you got that, Massey. You're using the four legged thing. Yeah, there we so go. there you go. And so he watches me after the first uh, session or the first um, uh, you know, session. It's about an hour and a half. During the break, he comes up to me and says, Victor, I know what you're doing wrong. I said, what? He said, look, Victor. And I'm, again, I'm giving you a short version. It's all, it's all described in the book. He said, you got to understand that people have objections in the audience that they're not going to voice. And your job is to take those objections that they have in their head and tie it down. I said, well, how do you do that? He says, just tie it down, Victor. That's as much advice as I got, right? I'm like, okay, that doesn't help a lot. Tie it down. And then about a couple of months later, and again, this part I'm making up also, it, like, it hit me. I was reading a book on how people buy, and I go, this is a secret. And so it's a four-step process I figured out. Take the objections they have in the audience, right? One was, I'm a technophobe. I'm not good with technology. That could be one of the reasons I'm not buying, right? And so here's the, here's the formula of blocking an objection. So that's my secret, man. I don't overcome objections. I block them because that's okay. a more effective strategy. And so I learned to block objections. And here's how you block an objection. First, you raise the objection. You raise it. And I explained the psychology of the difference between somebody raising it and you raising it. If somebody raises it, they've taken a position that they're likely not going to change. But if you raise it, you still control that. So that's not new. Understanding the psychology is, but that's not new. Now, you then offer to resolve the objection. That's step two. Three, you demo something. And here comes the important part. You tie down the objection. Let me state them all four. Raise the objection. Got it. Offer to resolve it. Demo something. And then tie down, not the sale, tie down the objection. So for example... I know somebody in the audience was thinking, this looks a little complicated, Victor. Now, if they say it, I'm screwed because they've taken a position, mm -hmm. right? So, I'll say, so I said something like this from the front of the room. I said, now, some of you might be thinking that this is really hard to use and you might be a technophobe. You're just afraid of technology. And if that's you, I want you to pay attention. So, what did I just do? I just raised the objection about being a technophobe, right? Yep. Just now, watch it. me offer to resolve it. But if I can show you with a couple of moves here and there, you'll be able to use it. Would you be open to that? And most people just nod their head, right? So then, demo, part three. I goes, let me just show you something, how easy it is to use. Point, click, cut, paste, 
drag drop, whatever I show, right? That's a demo. Yeah. Now, here's where I tie it down. I'm showing how simple it is, right? Here's the tie down. Remember, I'm tying down, not the sale, the objection. What's the objection? It's too difficult to use. Yep. So I'm about to tie it down. After I do my demo, I say something like this from the front of the room. Based on what I've shown you, do you think with a little practice and our support that you can do it? And I would wait for the verbal yes. Because mm. once they say yes, they've committed to that position. Now, here's what's powerful about that. Most people have five to seven objections in any process, whether you're presenting to investors who want, who want to give you money but are holding back, whether you're a B2B or B2C, there's five to seven objections why they don't want to buy. But if you can block the objections consistently throughout, let's say, the 30, 40 minutes you're talking, you will feel their resistance go down. So I went from an average close rate of 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 to 60, and sometimes it went even higher. But if I were to pick a range, I was in the 40 to 50 range easy after that. That wow. made me more money than I care to admit. So if you can block objections, so I wrote a book called Response Block Selling. You block their responses. So I'll send you the, I'll send you the e-book and then you can share. By the way, the book has 22, I believe, scripts for 22 common objections that you are going to get. And if you can sequence those throughout your presentation, let me say it again, you can sequence those throughout your presentation because you know how to block them and you know what the objections are, I'm telling you, you will feel the resistance go down and you will close more deals. I can't hear you now. Wow, I love there that. You. I yeah. love that. Yeah, so that is powerful. So I've been using that. And by the way, you know, the, by the way, that comes with a caveat because somebody's going to ask the question. What if they never raise an objection, then don't ever raise an objection that never was there. That's an obvious one, right? Never raise an objection that isn't there. Right. But if we were to sit around and huddle as a team at the table, we would figure out what the top five to seven objections are. And then what we would do is we would role play these objections. I would demo something like, let me block this objection, tell me if this works. And I would show. I said, by the way, some of you may be thinking our products are too expensive and yep. I can understand that, right? That was the first one. And I goes, I but if there. I can show you that in the long run, you're really winning, would you be open to that? Sure. Nah. And then I would demo something with price, talk about break-even points, total cost of ownership, return on investment. Then I'll say, hey, based on what I've shown you, can you now see within the first two years, our product will be more, at least cheaper than somebody else's or less expensive. And they're going to go, yeah, I can see that. And all of a sudden, you just dismiss the price issue. You can do this with almost any objection. Yep. As Bring you're it up talking. in advance for them. By the way, you can use, even use this response block system to reduce the resistance of your audience if you're doing a keynote. Like I always say this, now, remember, you're doing a sales keynote. There's people who are there 20 years, 30 years in the business, right? Yep. Here's how I block their, here's how I reduce their resistance. I said, by the way, how many of you have been in sales five years, 10 years, raise your hand, 20 years, 30 years. I, is it safe to say that some of you in here have been around so long that you heard and seen everything? Does that make sense? And you know what they'll say? Yeah. I, now, I, here's, here's the offer. But if I can show you just one or two strategies to maybe notch up those percentage points just a little bit, would you be open to that? And what do you think they always say? Yes, that's what I'm going to show you right now. And I jump into my demo. What I did was demonstrate respect for their abilities, right? But then I reduced their resistance by saying, I acknowledge that. But if I can show you a couple of things to help you increase your close rate by a few percentage points, would that be worth, it, worth your time? And they're always going to say what? Yeah. Yes. I and mean, as soon as they say yes, they've committed to listening to me. Mm. So you can use this in personal scenarios. Uh, my wife uses it on me. Knows I hate going out to dinner. She says, sweetie, I know you hate going out to dinner. Ooh, Raise what, the objection. Why do, you, why do you hate going out to dinner? Too many people. I'd rather eat dinner at home. My wife cooks great. But yeah. she goes, I know you hate going out to dinner. Raise the objection. But if I can show you a couple of restaurants I know won't be crowded, would you be open to it? Which restaurants? She shows me a few. Based on, well, I showed you which one of these best fits your needs or whatever. Where would you like to go? You can use it anywhere. That is the ultimate secret. But keep this in mind. If I can do storytelling, present my product, block objections at the same time, there is the trifecta of the ultimate presentation. Yeah. It's funny because I, I started studying all of this with uh, like webinar selling and presentation selling. Like some of the uh, uh, Russell Brunson, you know, who performed mm -hmm. at 10X. He was he's there. Great. Yep. He's great at that. He yeah. sold more software via oh God, automated sold. webinars. I think he sold like 800,000 or something. He's got a, he's got a, a he CD. He does a lot of that, that response yeah. blocking. Yeah, um, he, he does a, 
he uses a there was a web, there's a web the webinar series called webinar secrets or something. Yeah, yeah, funnel you should secrets. find it. Was that? I think not yeah, the, I think not the dot com secrets, not that one. Mm -hmm. There's another one that's just for webinars. Yeah. And what he does, he explains the psychology of what he does, and it's really fascinating. It's on a uh, I got I bought the DVD at the time, but I think you still download the uh, the video. It's a lot of watch. what you're talking about, like the response yep. tackling and like storytelling yep. and you got a villain and this and that. And then like, uh, right. But the so we, I learned that like, it was like, I think now 12 years ago when I started doing that. Wow. And man, it just works, man. It just works. And the close rate just skyrocketed on stage. It Every time up. that you added more uh, response blocking to objections, it just kept going up. That's it. It just layered in. So I, like I said, I learned from the best. I just, I, I think I'm the first guy to actually document it how it works. And that's why when you go through the 20 scripts, the 22 scripts, you'll see every typical objection you get is in there. Yeah. It's and then I give you the script. You play not with. interested. Send me more info. Yeah. Need to talk to my boss. It's too hard it. to use. Yeah. All Got to get two or three more competitive bids, you know, wow. maybe you next quarter. About it. Yeah. Yeah. Send me more info. That that's whole thing. awesome. And, and so was that the 1A secret? Or is that 1A and 1B? That's one, man. That's one. What Response the block is one. Uh, 1A would be if you understand the resistance, which is really their objections and not buying. Mm -hmm. If you really marinate with them, then you can build a whole response block structure around that. So in other words, back to my POV puking. Yep. If I can puke with them and understand why they wouldn't buy, then I can now build a response block structure within my presentation to block those reasons they wouldn't buy. Step one empathize with them, puke with them. Now that I know what your pain points are, now let me block those objections of why you don't want to buy. And this really works well at an enterprise level. You know what I mean? Because there's multiple reasons with multiple decision makers of why they don't want to buy. Wow. And if I can understand what those reasons are and build those into my presentation and block those objections, I'm telling you, it'll go that much smoother. I'm Great empathy. 10%. What, what was that? How much? Just yeah, again, you do the empathy piece, right? Yep. You're in there, you're marinating with them. I got it. Now that I know that, let me go ahead and list the five or seven reasons why they wouldn't buy. I list the five to seven reasons why they wouldn't buy. Mm -hmm. Then I build a response block structure around that. Perfect. And then I layer that right into my presentation. And what will happen is, if you can get the visual of this, you've got a 45 minute presentation. Within those 45 minutes, let's say every five minutes, you're blocking an objection right? And you'll feel the resistance go down. But what's even more fascinating is that you're going to realize sometimes if you block an objection too early, it doesn't work. So you should move it toward later. So then you start, just like index cards, you start moving your objection blocks around until they form the perfect sequence. Wow. And then you'll see that sucker go down. I love that, man. Yeah. Create empathy and then response block and prep in advance. Top two secrets. There it is, man. Victor. There it is. Antonio, where can the audience subscribe, learn, follow you for more? At minimum, uh, if you want the free stuff, uh, my Sales Influence podcast. These are 10-minute podcasts where I try to solve one simple problem in 10 minutes. Uh, if you want my courses, uh, go to my salesvelocityacademy.com website. That's sales velocityacademy.com. I have, I think, over 40 courses, now over 400 videos. And Dude, we add a new amazing. course every month. Uh, it's $29.99 per month. Uh, so, you know, you think about it, 30 times 12, that's $360 a year. It's a hell of an investment. I, by the way, if you buy the whole year, it's only like 300 bucks. So, uh, we talk about ROI at the beginning and education. This is a big one. And I think that's why, you know, I partnered with Grant Cardone. By the way, if you've bought Grant Cardone's system, my stuff is in there. So don't buy it twice, okay? So that, that's me trying to help you save money. That's amazing, man. Uh, incredible. So, so the website again? Uh, so two websites. Uh, really, look, victorantonio.com is easy. Yep. But really sign up for the free stuff, which is the Sales Influence Podcast, whether it's on iTunes, Stitcher, or, you know, or uh, Google Play. And then the salesvelocityacademy.com is where you'll get my courses. Perfect. I always yeah, like man. to repeat it twice for the podcast listeners, guys. That's all right, man. That's go, right. Go, go to Victor Antonio's website, subscribe, take his courses, check it all out. Follow and, me. And uh, follow you. And by the way, you know, as we wrap up, this will be additional bonus content here. Uh, thank you again so much, audience and the team, for following Sales Secrets from the Top 1%. Subscribe to the podcast. Buy the book at secretsalesbook.com. That's secretsalesbook.com to get the top sales secrets from the top 1% so that you can immediately increase sales today. Secretsalesbook.com. That's secretsalesbook.com.